Oh, you're going to like this. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, The Lord is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Do you need some help right now? Precious Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we believe we receive your help by your precious Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord. Breathe upon the word, God, that it might enter our heart and produce lasting effect, lasting results and produce fruit in this earth. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for all the help. We have great help right now on demand here in Jesus' name, amen. We're having a good time. We're in this series called How to Have. It's part two, and this segment is specifically entitled Good Relationships. Oh my goodness, that's the antidote for life. Good relationships. This message on God's truth about relationships can transform your life faster than any other part of your life because if there's any area people mess up on drastically, it's handling their relationships with wisdom. You can truly get free activating this. It will even affect your finances. You can be happy, content, at peace, in joy as you implement these life principles on how to have good relationships. Yes, you can enjoy family, marriage, friendships, and life working the dynamics of these truths. It's critical, critical to your future. Recently, I spoke with a family who had taken in an exchange student from overseas. They did it out of the kindness of their heart in order to be a blessing. It was an outflow of their faith and an opportunity to give to this girl who didn't seem to have very much. She lived with them for about a year, totally free, ate their food, and enjoyed all the benefits that their own children had, including birthday parties. Christmas gifts, special events, and on and on the list goes. Fast forward a few years later, and how do you think that student has responded? Not with thankfulness or gratitude, no. Instead, she's expressing resentment, a sense of entitlement, and unthankfulness. Now, of course, this is not a criticism of the great exchange programs because there are many great stories also. But what can we learn from this incident that sadly is not unusual? The seed of your investment in a relationship does not improve the ground, it proves the ground. I've got to say that again. The seed of your investment in a relationship does not improve the ground, it proves the ground. For many people, good people, the inability to understand this is the reason why they have had one bad relationship after another. Wrong relationships have to be tolerated. They have to be allowed to exist. It only takes one wrong relationship to sink your ship. Ask the boat crew transporting Jonah. Ask Samson about Delilah. Ask David. He had his own son, Absalom, who was a traitor. Jesus had Judas. But remember, Jesus chose Judas so he could get to the cross. So right now, we want to focus on how to have good relationships. It's critical, vital. First, let's recap on what we've learned in the initial launch of this series of how to have part one, because it's the principal wisdom on how to have, regardless of what it is that you need to know the PBR principle. Remember we talked about the PBR principle to answer how to have. You must intentionally perceive, believe, and receive. So first, perceive to believe to receive. If you don't like what you have, examine what it is you perceive, then what it is you believe, what it is you receive. If the glass is half empty, then you perceive it's half empty. You believe it's half empty. You live or receive a life that's empty. Now, it's vital to understand the Bible wisdom backing for this. Jesus said it this way, Mark 4 verse 25. Jesus said, for to him who has, more will be given. From him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. How in the world can you lose what you don't have? How can you have nothing and then still have more taken away? It's perception, perception. You always have something, even if it's another heartbeat or a second that's pain-free or a penny. 
You always have something, but when your perception is dark, my friend, you become unthankful for everything. The pennies, a heartbeat, a breath, a true friend, and then from him who has nothing, even what he does have is taken away. But as we learned in part one, we can reverse the losing and learn how to have by intentionally applying PBR principles based on God's word. Perceive it, believe it, receive it. So let's get super practical again and apply this to relationships. How to have good relationships. Gary, a bright seven-year-old, was asked about his thoughts on love. He said, It isn't always just how good you look. Look at me. I'm handsome like anything, and I haven't got anybody to marry me yet. (laughs) Gary, Gary, you've got some solid confidence going on there, buddy. (laughs) You already know this. You're going to have to perceive it. You're going to have to believe it, and then you're going to receive it. Even science is based on what we can observe what we can perceive. If you do not perceive the ability to fly, you will not believe the ability to fly. You will never receive the ability, oh, you guessed it, to fly. God's truth is the ultimate perception, but humanity tends to comfort itself, especially in the area of relationships. You can't have good relationships if you lie to yourself about relationships. Mark Twain, the famous author, said this, get your facts first, then you can distort them as you please. (laughs) Thomas Sowell, the prolific scholar, author, and economist, he said this, it takes considerable knowledge just to realize the extent of your own ignorance. That's so good. And can I further qualify that? It takes knowing God and knowing the right people. I've always been curious why so many churches in North America will put more effort and priority on teaching prayer while neglecting the critical of how to have good relationships. After all, if you don't know how to have good relationships, your prayers won't even work. Stephen, is that true? Absolutely. Look at this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone physically weaker since she is a woman. Show her honor. Show her respect as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. And of course, that goes both ways. We've got a lot of people praying with great evangelical technique, but their prayers are ineffective, hindered because they're without honor, without respect for God's family. Then you have to make these foolish doctrines around why your prayers aren't answered. Look, God wants to answer your prayers more than you want them answered, but he cannot break his own law of relationship to honor your request when you're intentionally dishonoring, let me hear it tell you, dishonoring a brother or a sister. Relationships matter. Yes, even to your prayers. Relationships even affect your charity, your spiritual giving. Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said this, so if you're presenting your offering at the altar, And while there, you remember that your brother has something such as a grievance or a legitimate complaint against you. Verse 24, leave your offering there at the altar and go. First, first, make peace with your brother and then come and present your offering, your giving, your alms, your charity. I've had people tell me, I I don't understand. I keep giving and giving and giving. I keep working and working and working. I keep trying and trying and trying. Why don't I get a harvest, Pastor Stephen? Well, a life without a harvest is proof that you've invested in the wrong people. Your relationships are wonky. In Matthew 5, Jesus tells us, get the relationship thing right so that you can receive the harvest on your offering, your gift, your seed. I told you at the start of this, this is a powerful God truth that will transform every aspect of your life. Isn't that good news? You can't even get saved from hell for heaven without the right relationship. Jesus, Judas, let his love for money come between him and the right relationship. 
So even the savior of the world couldn't save Judas. Can you imagine that? My friend, the how to have good relationships isn't just something, it's everything. Everything, it affects everything. There are too many people praying for a harvest instead of intentionally sowing for a harvest. Pray over your donation, but then you have to act on your faith and sow or nothing will grow. The area of failure most people fail tragically on is in their relationships. The enemy is so good at tricking people into sacrificing for wrong relationships while alienating the right relationships. People pursue confirmation and comfort instead of calibration and correction. Look at Proverbs 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You could say, so the right man sharpens the right man. It's as if we're pursuing the exact opposite, dullness. Just light up my social media page and with confirmation and affirmation and all kinds of likes and smiley faces, I'm digging that. But it's fake, it's without profit, it's even dangerous. This is not how to have, but how to lose, how to fail, wake up depressed with your life. Who cares how many times some friend agrees with you as you walk off the cliff? You're on the wrong path and you need discipleship. That's discipline, not alike. You're pursuing affirmation, not rightness. Ask yourself, who has permission to correct me? Well, how do you know if you're with the right people? Affirmation? There is a long, sad list of people who have lost everything as wrong people have confirmed their choices. Once again, a life without a harvest is proof you've invested in the wrong people. Someone once said this, a relationship without trust is like a car without gas. You can stay in it all you want, but it won't go anywhere. My friend, faith is not for the pursuit of what's wrong. Your life can and it will transform dramatically as you learn how to have good relationships. It's vital, critical, essential to your present and to your future. Okay, practical step number one on how to have good relationships. You've got to recognize what you've got. It's the first stage of our PBR principle and probably the most challenging on how to have. You must be able to perceive or discern with biblical accuracy. How can you be thankful for what you don't recognize? How can you eliminate what you don't recognize as a contradiction to wisdom and truth if you don't discern it? Martin Luther King Jr. said this, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into friend. But you've got to recognize an enemy or you'll never know when they've transformed into a friend because the act of loving a friend isn't the same as loving your enemy. Jesus recognized Peter to be a rock and he spoke destiny into his future. He saw Judas as a disloyal enemy, so Jesus released him quietly to pursue his evil, but he didn't shame him. Look, no matter how much work, sacrifice, or investment you put into making a good relationship with a fool or even worse, an evil person, it will never ever work. Not to your benefit. God's word doesn't support it, condone it, or applaud it. You forgive your enemies and then you walk away. That's love. Yes, even Jesus worked step one for his relationships. Recognize what you've got or who you've got. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 20 that ended with, is your eye evil? Is your perception evil? Because I am good. He was asking, are you a haver or are you a not haver? This is so critical to your future, to your prayers, your giving, your living. If you don't recognize a fool, you will tolerate him or her and wonder why all the wise, good people exit your life. Wisdom has no tolerance for foolishness. That's Bible. That's Proverbs. Could it be that the right people aren't leaving you, but they're leaving your unwillingness to discern, recognize, and perceive? Wise people have an obligation to be obedient to God more than confirm your choices. 
Yes, I just said that out loud, didn't I? <laughs> Wise people have an obligation to be obedient to God more than confirming your choices. So step number one on how to have good relationships, you've got to recognize what or whom you've got. Step number two on how to have good relationships, now celebrate what you've got. Celebrate whom you have in your life. Once a farmer removes the chaff from the grain, recognition turns into a celebration. Let me give you both sides of the coin in this area. What you celebrate comes to you. What you fail to celebrate or what you fail to recognize, it will move away from you, period. Whatever you fail to celebrate and value will move away from you, even run away from you. Here it is in ultra practical terms because this principle works for more than just relationships. A, if you don't celebrate the pennies, you'll find that even the dollars move away from you. B, if you don't celebrate your next heartbeat, you'll disrespect the breath of life. C, if you don't learn to celebrate the little gifts, you never qualify for the bigger gifts. D, if you refuse to celebrate correction, you'll never have wise people as friends. Never, never, never. E, if you don't celebrate difference, you'll never have harmony, diversity, or even good steel. F, little babies are the outcome of the celebration of differences. Just think about that one. G, a great rock band is the celebration of differences playing the same song. Think about it. H, a celebration of 26 letters produces about 171,000 English words currently in use. Wow. So yes, yes to have good relationships. You've got to know how to celebrate what you've got. This is the second step now building on the first step, which is recognizing what you've got. How about this for simple, right? If you're a glass is half full type person, you will tend toward being a haver. If you're a glass is half empty kind of person, you will tend and move toward being a not haver. You choose your focus. You choose your perception. How? It's by your thankfulness. What are you thankful for? That's your thankfulness quotient. Do you express it? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances may be. Be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. We're called to thank God in everything and for everyone that God has given us, but we also need to express that thankfulness to one another. Step number two has to be intentional. You've got to celebrate the relationships God gives you. To celebrate means you must communicate. And I'll talk more in depth about that in communication part three. But you must celebrate those relationships that God blesses you with. You do that by being thankful and acting on the inspiration and the energy that being a haver generates. Use your words, use your face, appropriate touch, your attention. Use it all. When Pam and I were first married, she was out of town one weekend doing a women's conference. So I thought I'd be ambitious and tackle all the laundry, which includes girl clothes. And at that point, I was definitely, that was definitely not my specialty. No, Pam had this beautiful suit made of cashmere. So I just wanted to wash it the way I wash everything, hot and hot, and then throw it in the dryer on high. Well, needless to say, when I pulled it out, that flowing, beautiful, loose-fitting pantsuit now looked like a three-year-old's track suit. And when Pam got home, I very cautiously showed her the suit, neatly placing it on a hanger, I might add, as I was trying to apologize and make everything look right. And Pam just cheerfully thanked me for doing the laundry and quickly changed into the outfit saying, hey, I'll just use them to work out in. It was like a little biker shorts and a little halter top. It was hilarious. But Pam had an amazing attitude, amazing. She was so thankful that I tried to bless her by doing her laundry, even though I ruined her expensive cashmere suit. She expressed thankfulness. It only made me love her even more and made me want to bless her with all of my heart. She celebrated my effort even when it failed. She celebrated me. You know, the whole get your hands in the air like you just don't care. Step number two, celebrate 
what you have, whom you have. This is essential to how you have good relationships. You are not replaceable, my friend. To celebrate you, you must celebrate others. Step number three on how to have good relationships, be faithful. Be faithful with what you've got. Is it a friendship, an employee-boss relationship? Is it a marriage? Maybe a granddaughter, grandmother relationship, a father-son relationship. After steps one and two, you need to be faithful. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For a relationship to please God, it needs to be based in faith. The Bible defines the term faith this way, Hebrews 11, verse one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Many people live lonely, hurt lives, waking up one day to realize there's little to no substance to their relationships. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Marriages fail because of a lack of true faith, not love. First John 4 says, love never fails. But the lie is that love failed in all these broken marriages. Even one tiny ray of real love is able to dispel a world of darkness. So what's the problem? Well, faith and love are in tandem. The Bible says they abide together, they work together. Few people getting married ever receive counsel or direction on how to maintain and grow the substance of their relationship. Faith is that substance. Love needs a container, and that's faith. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's like saying, without faith, it's impossible to please love, to host love, to retain love. That's why unfaithful people are extremely bad at love. They're inconsistent, easily offended. They're insecure. I just told you, you are not replaceable. That means your faith is irreplaceable. Your faithfulness has a unique spiritual ID imprint. Your love moves through faith and only faith. That's critical to know. Proverbs 20, verse 6, Many a man proclaims his own loving kindness and goodness, but a faithful man, a faithful woman, who can find... Many people casual say, hey, I love you, man. <laughs> I love you. But a faithful person is so very hard to find. Within that word faithful, you can find loyalty, commitment, trustworthy. When Joseph in the book of Genesis was sold into slavery, the Bible says that he was faithful and loyal in the house he worked even when he was falsely accused. Then he was faithful in the prison for years. Did Joseph know how to have good relationships? Absolutely. He forgave his brothers for selling him into slavery and he was faithful even as a slave and then as a prisoner. Does it work again? Absolutely. After 13 years, a Hebrew man was promoted to ruler over all of the Egyptian world, second only to Pharaoh himself. Faithfulness overcomes injustice. We have a culture right now that wants to protest injustice, but only faithfulness conquers injustice. Jesus said in Luke 16, verse 10, he said, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Good relationships must be recognized, celebrated, and fostered with what? Faithfulness. Step number three on how to have good relationships, be faithful. Be faithful with what you've got. And finally, step number four on how to have good relationships, be Christ-centered with everyone. Now, please don't get weird or religious here. This simply means allow Jesus' excellent example to guide us, to guide you. Don't ask, what would Jesus do? Just do it. Jesus, describing himself in Matthew 11, says, learn of me. I am meek. I'm humble. Philippians 4, verse 5 says, let your gentleness be made known unto all men. Pride is always wrong, and humility will always precede God lifting you up even exalting you. First Peter 5 says that. Do you want to know how to be a haver? How to have good relationships? Be focused on Jesus 
learn his way. Get a relationship coach, a pastor, somebody who knows how to do it Jesus way. Smart people get help. You might say, Stephen, I've made such a mess of all of my relationships. I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to focus on Jesus. Or as you say, be Christ-centered. Well, first of all, know this. You are not replaceable. Think about that. Jesus died for you. But you've got to have the truth. Be a haver, my friend. Take hold of this and have it. Let's keep it very simple. Let's do exactly what Jesus said right here in Matthew 11, verse 28. He said, come to me. Jesus is calling you. He's saying, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, overburdened, many relationship failures, many divorces. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. I will cause you to rest. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound good to your heart? All good relationships ultimately start with the best relationship of all. Having Jesus as the Lord, the director, the Lord of your life. After all, he's the expert on how to have, how to have life, how to have friendship, a career, you name it, how to have good, excellent relationships. Starting right now, right here in this moment by praying this prayer with me. Come on, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be the king of my life. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave, conquered death and hell. You are the ultimate relationship. I need to have you in my life. You are savior, redeemer. Thank you for helping me to live for you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.